Hello and welcome to Yodo. I'm Dr. Sarah Bohm. Today we're going to discuss recurrent ascites and liver disease. I'm very grateful to Dr. Vigilo Severa. He's an osteopathic physician uh, in the uh, residency program here in Orlando area, and he helped prepare a lot of this information for today's video. Our topic today is ascites. Other names for ascites include the older term abdominal dropsy or peritoneal cavity fluid or hydroperitoneal, but it's the collection of fluid with inside of the abdominal cavity, not inside of the intestines, but actually kind of the intestines are sort of floating inside of this fluid in the abdomen. So it's not really within an organ, but it's inside of the abdominal cavity and just kind of um, extra fluid that accumulates there. Typically there's no free fluid inside of the abdominal cavity. If there is, it's a really small amount, like 25 milliliters, maybe two tablespoons total that's inside of that cavity. But when fluid builds up inside of the abdominal cavity, there's cause for concern. There can be multiple causes for ascites. Most common cause is liver disease. And of the liver disease processes that can cause ascites, cirrhosis is the most common. About 50% of patients with liver disease will at some point develop ascites. Looking at ascites a different way, a cirrhosis patient will make up nearly 80% of the patient population that has ascites. Other medical conditions can also cause this process though. It could be from a type of cancer or infection. Cancers that can commonly cause this may include ovarian, breast, colon, stomach, pancreatic, or liver cancer. Infections that can cause ascites could be hepatitis. And you got to remember, hepatitis is the, the big H, the viral hepatitis, because the little H is just inflammation. It doesn't necessarily specify a virus that's causing it. Tuberculosis can cause ascites to occur, and an autoimmune problem can cause ascites. And we, we do talk about some autoimmune diseases in a different video. But that word hepatitis roughly means liver inflammation. And so remember, don't confuse that with an infectious process. It's just an inflammatory process. But of the different types of hepatitis viruses, there are several within that subclass of hepatitis. So there's no necessarily one infectious cause. There are multiple, again, and it takes a diagnosis procedure to find out what's causing that. Most often it's viral, but could be bacterial. 10% of the patients with ascites have ascites caused by a heart issue. And it could be from elevated portal venous pressure. It could be constrictive pericarditis or right heart failure. So a heart process could cause that buildup of fluid within the abdominal cavity. Other causes of the fluid buildup could be pancreatic issues, liver vein blockages, and even some dialysis patients will develop ascites. And uh, they have a nephrotic syndrome that can develop, and that's a very worrisome process. One of the reasons that the fluid accumulates in the abdomen is something is blocking that blood circulation from when the blood doesn't go through the liver easily. And so that backup can cause the water to kind of squeeze out of the blood vessels. The blood doesn't, the blood cells don't leak out, but the fluid can leak out into the abdomen. So learning what has caused that blood flow to be restricted helps the medical team determine the cause of the ascites. The pressure needed to push that circulation through a scarred liver or past an obstruction forces that fluid to come out into the abdomen. Regardless of that cause, if portal hypertension is present, it can result in those higher pressures needed and that blood cells will stay in the blood vessel and the water will leak out and cause that fluid to accumulate in the abdomen. Symptoms that are reported with ascites can include an increase in the abdominal size, abdominal pressure occurring with discomfort, bloating, feelings of a decreased appetite, possibly indigestion, and certainly edema in the ankles can occur. They might have nausea and vomiting, and they might have some weight gain because of that extra fluid. So it's not like their body is gaining weight, it's just extra fluid accumulating in their abdomen. They might have constipation, they might have shortness of breath. Many are gonna tell us that they have decreased mobility as well as back pain from that abdomen getting large and pulling on their abdomen. The fluid buildup rarely occurs in healthy people. Patients with ascites often are gonna have symptoms that are more general, such as fatigue, 
heartburn, and many are going to report an increased frequency or amount of urination. Evaluation of ascites is going to start with the history of the patient, followed by a physical exam and, of course, some lab testing. Diagnosis is typically going to be confirmed by imaging, and the radiology imaging that might be done could be plain x-rays, ultrasound, and possibly CAT scan or other imaging processes. The imaging test can discern the location and the amount of fluid, as well as if the fluid is uh, liquid enough to be removed, because sometimes it can get thick and the fluid is just too thick to be removed. So they have that fluid in their abdomen, but we can't get it out because it's like congealed, if you would use that as a term. Removal of the fluid will reduce the symptoms, but it doesn't prevent that buildup from occurring again. When the fluid is tapped, some of that fluid is sent off for lab testing. So a paracentesis is the process of removing that fluid or tapping it, and it's therapeutic, but it can also be diagnostic. Typical tests to evaluate that fluid will include getting a blood count, looking for white blood cells, the albumin and total protein contents, as well as the cytology of the fluid that they get from the abdomen. Serum ascites level has, uh, is calculated as well as the serum level of albumin, and then that's compared to each other. So if it's greater than a predetermined amount, looking at the uh, albumin in the ascites and the albumin in the blood, that helps the clinician determine if it's a transudative or an exudative type of ascites. And having that information will help the evaluation and determine the treatment option that's going to help reduce that fluid from returning. Transudates typically are due to an increase in portal pressure, maybe caused by cirrhosis, hepatic congestion, congestive heart failure, or if that portal vein becomes thrombosed. Transudative ascites will often respond to diuretic medications. Late in the disease course, ascites can become refractory to medications, and the ascites may not respond to the same medications that they used to work very well for the patient. An exudative fluid, there's a lower serum ascites albumin gradient, and it's more indicative of an infectious process, or nephrotic syndrome, or a malignancy. It might indicate malnutrition or low albumin levels of the patient. Abnormal cytology can indicate something called carcinomatosis, which can be a very worrisome process because that means there's a diffuse abdominal cancer. It's not in one area, but it's little bits of cancer throughout the abdomen. Interestingly, cytology evaluation may not be helpful for the evaluation because sometimes, although a patient has a malignancy, the ascites fluid may not contain some of those cancer cells. Paracentesis is the process to remove or tap that fluid, and it provides most patients with pretty rapid or immediate results. For the vast majority of patients have a big improvement of their symptoms pretty quickly and it's not uncommon for as much as four to six liters to be removed during the procedure because sometimes it can build up quite slowly and the patient can become accustomed to it until that fluid load becomes so large that they have considerable symptoms. Then they get the ultrasound done, the fluid is tapped, and it can be quite a bit of fluid. They can have pretty immediate reduction of their symptoms as a result of having that fluid tapped. Ultrasound is usually used to determine the amount of the fluid and the location of that fluid. There are risks associated with that paracentesis though. Some of the complications can include bowel perforation, internal bleeding, or even hemorrhage. The development of an infection inside of that fluid in the abdomen could occur. There could be circulation dysfunction that occurs in some patients after paracentesis because it's a decreased amount of the fluid from that person's body and a decline in their total protein inside of their body. It's also possible that the small opening where they placed that needle, that that place doesn't close quickly and there can be some leaking from that site for a period of time. Sometimes just a few hours, but sometimes it could be several days. It's important to remember that the fluid is not just water, that there are proteins and other chemicals or electrolytes in that fluid. It is mostly water, but not all water. So if large amounts of that fluid are going to be removed and it's going to be done often, many times those patients will be provided additional support, whether it's being given uh, um, administration of albumin either just before, during, or right after that procedure, or possibly electrolytes. Unfortunately, when we administer artificial albumin, it's nothing like what the patient makes, and so the, bi the body kind of biodegrades it pretty rapidly. If 
recurrent taps are being performed and the fluid is being removed on an ongoing basis, patients can tend to have weakness that they sense after that removal of the fluid because of the loss of protein and electrolytes. And they can report that they feel more weak or they feel more fatigued even though they feel relief in their abdomen. Patients certainly will want to have that fluid removed because of the relief of the symptoms that they get, but they may not like to have the fluid removed because of the side effects of the procedure. Patients that require recurrent paracentesis may request for an external drainage catheter to be replaced because the procedure can be done in a different setting than needing to go to the hospital to have it done. Think of like a spigot with a small soft, thin plastic catheter that goes through the abdominal wall. And that's going to allow for intermittent access to drain that fluid without the repetitive needle insertions being done on the patient's abdomen wall. And they don't have to go back to the hospital or an imaging center to have it done. The actual timing of the draining of fluid, how much, how long that process takes is really only a few minutes. So that's not a significant investment of time. However, if you got to think about the patient's got to get ready, they got to leave their home, they've got to drive in traffic, they have to check in at the facility, I'm sure every time they check in, they're going to ask, answer the same 50 questions that are going to be asked of them about name, insurance, their symptoms, what's your you know, physician's name. And so it can be a time commitment. A lot of people get to the point where they would just rather be able to do that in a different environment. So many patients particularly patients on hospice, will request that these drainage catheters be placed so that the hospice staff can drain that ascites fluid when the patient becomes symptomatic. And they can even teach family members, if they're willing, how to open that little catheter and drain that fluid. And they will provide all that supply. So it's not like you're going to be draining it into a cup or something. It's, it's a complete set of supplies that they're going to provide for that catheter to be drained. And most families are going to want that hospice staff to be present when that's done or the hospice staff to do that. Pigtail catheters are not commonly used because they do have a higher risk of infection, leaking, and occlusion. Tunnel catheters, or called Plurex catheters, are more common because this type of catheter has a lot lower risk of infection. It's a specialized catheter that has actually some bacterial resistant properties present in that catheter. It's got to be placed with imaging guidance and it has to heal for a short period of time before it's used. Once it's in place though, patients do very well with that, with that type of catheter, with the Plurex catheter or a tunnel catheter, and it can remain in place for several months. In addition to the lower risk of infection, it has a lot lower risk of leaking and a lot lower risk of accidental removal. There are other patient interventions that are available as well. There's a peritoneal venous shunt system, and that channels peritoneal fluid that contains protein back into the circulation by way of a connection from the inside of the abdomen to the vena cava. And this is used to treat patients with some types of cancers that recurrently develop that ascites. This procedure is more invasive, and so that procedure has to be performed in the hospital, and it's reserved for patients with a life expectancy of more than a few weeks, like maybe six weeks or eight weeks or longer. Nearly 25% of patients with this type of peritoneal venous shunt system will eventually develop issues with it though, and it can occlude and become no, no longer functional as their disease process advances. The TIPS procedure is short for transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, and this TIPS allows for communication between the portal vein and the hepatic vein and it reduces the elevated pressure in the liver and can improve the patient's sodium balance. Patients with portal hypertension and having issues from esophageal bleeding can be seen to have severe cirrhosis as one of the more common causes. And there are several criteria used to determine if this procedure is going to help a patient. This procedure cannot be done if there are conditions that cause pulmonary hypertension or if certain valve issues with a patient's heart are present or if the patient has advanced congestive heart failure because it is going to put more pressure back on that heart. Again, it, these procedures do not treat the liver disease itself but are used to manage the symptoms of ascites associated with that liver problem. 
Each of these procedures does carry risks, and it's important to discuss with your care team and your specialist which of these procedures, if any, you might be a candidate for. Some of the complications of ascites are going to include the symptoms that we've talked about earlier, as well as fluid that could collect in the lungs or the development of a hernia, and even kidney failure. The most acute worrisome issue for someone with ascites is when that fluid in the abdomen gets infected. The fluid in the abdomen, when the ascites becomes infected, it can occur spontaneously and suddenly without warning, and it results in a process called bacterial peritonitis. Patients are going to have fever, severe abdominal pain, and they're going to require antibiotics. And the antibiotics may need to be given for an extended period of time. When ascites does become infected, a person and has peritonitis, it is a really worrisome condition and life-threatening. When the ascites has gotten to a severe point and it's no longer um, being able to be managed with oral medications, that's when most patients are going to begin to want to have that fluid tapped on a regular basis and use one of those catheters that we've discussed. So having ascites certainly is a worrisome finding. It can be treated and you can get that fluid removed, but the underlying cause that's present is still happening and may not be a curable process. Having ascites is a call to action. It's a call for the patient and their loved ones to ask some difficult questions about their illness and open topics regarding the disease stage, the, their prognosis, and the trajectory. Ignoring the problem doesn't make it go away. Ascites is the main complication of people with cirrhosis. Prognosis is not related to treating the ascites, but the cause of it. So when patients with liver disease decompensate and develop ascites, it is a, a worrisome prognostic sign. For some types of cancer and patients with end-stage kidney disease, the development of ascites can indicate that life expectancy is now less than six months. It can be a marker that the cancer process has reached its end stage. Some patients, although a patient has serious illness and some disease causing that abdominal fluid collection, may not be in the last six months of life. There are diseases that have treatments available for the underlying cause of ascites, so the, the ascites will go away as that underlying cause is treated. Once that disease is uh, treated then and the liver improves, then that ascites will resolve and they won't get that at least in the near future, unless that disease recurs. Development of ascites most often indicates that a person has a life expectancy of five years or less. But for some patients, it about half of them, it may indicate that their life expectancy is two years or less. For some diseases, there are treatments and medications that will manage those diseases, although the life expectancy is still limited. It's extremely important to follow your physician's recommendations and to have ongoing conversations. It's important to have those ongoing conversations because recurrent ascites certainly indicates that the liver is failing to respond to the disease treatment. And some of these liver conditions may make a patient eligible for consideration of a liver transplant. And that's a very complicated and long process. Sadly, not all patients are candidates for transplant if the condition even would respond to a transplant because of, of another medical issue. Being eligible for transplant doesn't necessarily mean a transplant will be available either. So that is a very difficult process and a very long process to be evaluated for. First, physicians during treatment of the liver disease are going to request that patients eliminate all alcohol and they're going to be encouraged to be very cautious with their sodium intake. Foods such as bacon, Canned foods, processed meats, snack foods, sauces, soups, and nuts are all very high in salt content. Some conditions will require limiting fluids to less than 1,500 milliliters a day, and that's just three 500 mil bottles. That's not very much fluid. So too much salt and too much fluid can certainly aggravate the liver problem and aggravate the ascites. Ascites will develop a lot more rapidly. Oral medications such as diuretics are commonly used as first-line treatment to decrease the amount of fluid accumulating in their abdomen. But as we said, many times patients develop progressive disease and that those medications are not going to provide relief for the patient. Many times patients are also requested to limit the amount of acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications such as um, ibuprofen or aspirin. Some medications can affect the liver directly and other 
medications may affect the kidneys and cause too much fluid to be retained, thus putting more pressure on the liver. This was a lot of information about ascites, and I hope that I gave you a little bit better understanding. Think of ascites as a symptom, a clinical finding that something is wrong with the liver. Having fluid in the abdomen does not tell you the cause or the treatment for that liver problem, but it certainly indicates that a serious process is occurring. The most common causes are alcohol-related cirrhosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, now called metabolic dysfunction-associated steatotonic liver disease. There are many more disease processes, including alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, acute hepatic porphyria, Gilbert syndrome, hematochromatosis, lysosomal acid lipase deficiency, or Wilson's disease. So there's a lot of processes that can cause the development of ascites. Some patients will have the ability to alter their trajectory by avoiding alcohol and other substances that have been damaging to the liver, but for some patients, the development of ascites is part of that disease process and just indicates that another stage of that disease is now occurring, and for these folks, it can indicate decline and limited life expectancy. There are many other complications of liver disease in addition to ascites. If you're interested in learning more about these, please drop a comment below and I will get it on the schedule for you. Thank you for being here today. If you have questions about ascites that weren't addressed, please let me know and I will get to those. If you think this information might be helpful for others, please forward this to them. Thank you. Bye now.